What is AI, and does it mean the end of the human era? This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew. On KOWL 1490, The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. I want to start this one, this episode out with something that we've been doing pretty much every episode of What Really Matters, simply explaining what we mean by our terms, you know, AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah, so we need to know what everything means so you guys can know what we're talking about, because you might have a different idea of what so-and-so is than we will, so it's important to define things. Right. Artificial intelligence isn't isn't just like some Terminator technology. It's any <laughs> no. it's any attempt to emulate human intelligence in a machine or most likely a computer program. Sometimes when you think of artificial intelligence, it's almost like, oh, it's just meant to play games or to beat you at some certain task. And that's true. You can have artificial intelligence on tic-tac-toe or artificial intelligence on chess. But there's also more subtle forms of artificial intelligence which are embedded into modern technology. So, for example, streetlights use artificial intelligence to make traffic more efficient. And also, Google is a form of artificial intelligence. Well, the search engine, at least. And uh, you may have experienced some mundane form of artificial intelligence when you got emails related to your Amazon searches. Yes. So, artificial intelligence is really apparent when there's some internet or computer service that presents itself or makes some task that human actors or you know human human employees didn't do themselves that's a, that's really all that artificial intelligence is it's 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 a form of intelligence only emulated in the computer it manifests itself very differently from intelligence in this physical world right but artificial intelligence has the same sort of features as regular intelligence it's processed very differently though I think at this point we should go into the history of artificial intelligence because I think that would provide a context for what we're going to talk about. Of course, you said the end of humanity, so that's quite important (laughs) to talk about maybe before the end of humanity what led up to it. Yeah, we, we we need to know where we're coming from before we start going to crazy places like the end of the human era. That's a big... Uh, that's a big statement to make. So It's a big jump to make. Yeah. So first of all, artificial intelligence, I think the term itself really came out of uh, the 60s and 70s. When science fiction writers were talking about robots that could communicate and uh, control actions that would normally be designated to human control. So for example, there was the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. He came up with the three laws of robotics. And this was important because he envisioned that AIs might become rogue in the future or they might do something that is harmful to humans. Right, so, B- because they are intelligences, and in Asimov's mind, he, uh, you, it's, you, it's hard to rein in an intelligence that can think around its own limitations. Well, I think we can go more into how AIs could be harmful, potentially, in later parts of this episode. Right. But essentially, the significance of this was that Isaac Asimov forecasted that AIs might be a significant yeah. harm to human. Mm-hmm. Now... After after AI, you know, the term existed in the mm-hmm. 60s and 70s, it really took until 1997 when Garry Kasparov was beaten by a computer in chess. And the chess name was called Deep Blue, and it was created by IBM. And the reason why this represented a turning point, this represented AIs actually, you know, physically being able to beat humans in, in tasks that humans originally didn't think yeah. that was possible. It was traditionally thought that chess would be extremely difficult for an AI to be a human in because you needed some of that intrinsic human intelligence that comes from not being a set of equations. You see, when you ask someone how, how they're good at chess, they can they can give you some type of an answer, but it, it, it boils down to, oh, I can just see the moves, you know, and it boils down to the intelligence of the person yeah. playing it or how many times they've been able to play it. And but when AIs suddenly beat humans, then we realize that maybe it isn't yeah. about intelligence. And it, it may seem obvious now that, oh, you know, of course an AI would be the human at chess. We've known that for years. But at the time, chess was not something people were thinking AIs would be beating humans in. We thought there was something about chess that AIs couldn't do. Now we know, okay, AIs are good at prediction, so it means they're good at chess because they can predict moves. But back then, that wasn't foreseeable. Right. So, uh, yes, what you said, it makes sense that AIs would be able to be good at a task that simply calculates possible moves in the future. So then you might add, well, it it can't do things like speak to other humans. It can't can't process natural language in the way we can. 
But that was proven wrong in 2011, when IBM created a new machine called IBM Watson, which was able to beat human contestants in Jeopardy. IBM likes making AIs that can beat people in different games. But the the importance of Jeopardy is it's a human, it's, it's an intrinsically human game. It's a human asking humans questions about human things. It It isn't a game of calculation like AI. Jeopardy is all about people, so an AI being able to beat people at a people game is pretty crazy. And of course, Jeopardy is a little harder than just simply Googling the question. So I think some people confuse the, the fact that the IBM Watson machine was able to come up with a question to the answer, you know, because mm-hmm. that's how the way Jeopardy works, with be, just being able to search a database. But it's much more complicated than just being able to search a database because it's being able to obtain and basically mine the relevant information. And that's what our human human brains do because yeah. we have a whole bunch of information that we gathered over the years when but- when you're reading google right you don't have an ai reading it for you i mean google works off a system of tags the ai doesn't really know what it's pulling up for you it just it, pulls up a list of possibly yeah. relevant links that might have the answer within them yeah it doesn't have the intrinsic ability to understand on some level what's relevant but the Watson, the Watson AI, it can. I mean, it, on some level, it, it takes the Google pages and then it reads them. Yes. So what I was saying was that basically an important feat in AI itself is being able to rep- or be, being able to understand what information is relevant and what is not. Because, for example, humans have a whole bunch of information that we're given from childhood all the way till now. We have tons of information that we've learned in school and from experience. But when you... When you do a specific task, you're able to pull up exactly relevant information that's important for doing the task. For example, if you if you have two job offerings, then you will use the relevant information from your past to decide which offering is the best. You won't just be overwhelmed with so much information from your childhood or something like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. You can parse your memory, and that's the important thing in AI. Right. So then after that, you might think, okay parsing, being able to calculate the best moves, those are all important. But humans have a more natural element. They they can look at things and basically recognize intuition or intuistic is that a word? Intuistic intuistic? I don't know. With they, intuition recognize. They yes, they can use their intuition to guide themselves through intuitively. actions. Intuitively. Intuitively, yes. That's the word. They can intuitively guide themselves through actions. And so that was something that Google's AlphaGo actually did recently. So AlphaGo is is a board game, just like chess, but it's different from chess because, like I said before, in chess, when you ask the best chess players why they're doing a particular move, they can't really ask you. But this is taken to the extreme in Go. Yeah. Go players simply know what the best move is solely based on their intuition. And so it has to do with some natural human element, you know, pattern recognition within their brain itself. Yeah, pattern recognition that even we're not fully consciously aware of. Yes, so Google was able to create a machine that was able to do the same thing and beat the top world players at Go. And the way it did this was different than the IBM Watson Deep Blue, or IBM Watson or Deep Blue, yeah. because it used a neural network. It used an artificial neural network which simulated the neural networks that we have in our brain. Yeah. Now, the way a neural network sort of works, it it tries to emulate the way our brains function as opposed to, say, working off a system of equations and trying to find the best answer. Instead, a neural network's purpose, or at least the theoretical purpose, is to eventually be able to think through complex problems exactly the way a human would and come to a logical answer with a crazy amount of information. Well, you see, you said logical answer there, and I think it's important to distinguish here because a neural network isn't really coming up with the most logical answer. It's simply it's simply a heuristic to decide which answer is the best because computers are, of course, very good at logic. But it's humans that we kind of think of humans as being separate from computers because we aren't completely logical. But then if you have this example of a computer that doesn't just use logical problems and logical steps to arrive at an answer, then you have to realize that in some sense, they're getting closer to us in our intelligence. And uh, right now, they're not at our intelligence. I mean, not even close at the current moment. Right now, even that Go AI 
is probably not much smarter, if less smart, than an ant. I mean, ants have a lot to th- to think about. You know, their their brains are constantly moving. They have to be thinking about all their legs. They have to be thinking about where food is, things like that. But they don't have conscious thought. They don't have awareness of their being. And they don't obviously deal with the same complex problems as people. Now, you might be thinking, how is this possible that something that can beat top human players at a game is not even as intelligent as an ant? And the reason is simple. It's because the AIs that we produce so far are called weak AIs. They're, yeah. they're very narrowly focused and can only do a specific task. Whereas ants, as simple as they are in terms of animals and and the and the kingdoms of life. Yeah, absolutely. As simple as they are, they are very general, and they're very generalized to their environment. They can solve problems in a way that you can't really anticipate with just simple intelligence. Ants' brains aren't just good at grabbing food. They're also good at walking. They're good at a vast number of things that a computer just wouldn't be able to really simulate right now. If you're just tuning in, this is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. And you might think, okay, well then, if in the 60s we just came up with a term of AI, and now, over 50 years later, we don't even have AI as good as an ant, where has it gotten us? Then I, I think there's not a reason to despair, and the reason why is because of something called accelerating growth, or or as you've probably maybe heard of it, Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says, well, it's, it's simply a prediction of the future of computers themselves. So the original prediction said that the number of transistors on a computer chip would double every two years. But it's, it's since become more generalized. People now use it as a way to express that technological development happens exponentially. Yeah. So it, even though over the course of 50 years we've only gotten from nothing to an ant, that means that it could just be another few decades before we get from an ant to a human. Yeah, that's why you should be a little a, a little wary of even an AI that's simply the intelligence of an ant. Because if an AI can do something we're going to talk about later, self-learn, it will eventually get to get to the intelligence of a human very rapidly. And then I think that bridges perfectly into our next topic we're going to talk about. The, the kind of end state of AI, super yeah. intelligence or the, the singularity, the technological singularity. This is heavily debated within even the experts on AI, people who work on AI every day. These, it's vastly disputed there. Uh, there's some optimistic people who think, oh, hyper-intelligent AIs are only a year off. There's some very pessimistic people who say we'll never get there. It's a heavily debated topic, but we're try- going to try to get to the summary of what most of these experts are thinking. I'd also like to add that, yes, yeah, some of the experts say this is nonsense, and then some of the experts say this is a thing that will happen within a decade. Yeah. So there's no, there's no like definitive opinion on the issue, or if you even call it an issue, you know, depending on your point of view. So before we go into this, it's more of it's more of just speculation on the future of what might come. So basically, the entire idea is that at some point, a, a computer will get to the intelligence of a human. And humans are, you know, very intelligent. I'm sure yeah. you listening would know you're very intelligent. Yeah, you're more intelligent than anything else, than any other species on this planet, that's for sure. Yeah, it's often said that the human brain is the most complex machine in the universe. But once it once it becomes true that, you know, we just have a, another machine that's as complex as the, <laughs> yeah. the previous most complex it's, machine. It's going to get really, really weird. It can make a large impact. Mm-hmm. So one of the first things that obviously makes an impact is that Computers can be produced much faster than humans can. So, for example, humans have changed our environment because we were able to get to a population of over 7 billion. But computers can simply be produced in a factory. So if you have a computer that's as intelligent as a human, it can be mass-produced and vastly outnumber humans. That's yeah. that's just one of the reasons why this might be <laughs> beneficial or harmful. The mass production of humans isn't really an easy thing to get behind. But an important thing to get back to here is I've heard a lot of people talk about, when they're talking about AI, when I try to talk to them about this subject, they say a very common thing, we can never create something more intelligent than ourselves. That's crazy. You, uh, The creator can't make something more intelligent than themselves. 
And that's something we need to dispel right now if we're going to move on. I'm sure there's a few people at home who are thinking right now, that's ridiculous. You can't make something more intelligent than the creator. Well, the thing is, is when people say that, I'm not really sure what they're talking about because we've already... You know, that's kind of the purpose of technology, to, to <laughs> yeah. make something that's better than you at the at the particular task. Yeah, I, I that's why you'd create a plow, because it's better than better than trying to plow with your hands. So the fact is, all technology that we've created thus far is simply better at, better at us at some particular task. So I'm not really sure why intelligence can't be any different. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I don't know why thinking is exempt. But even going by their logic... The whole idea of superintelligence is you start with something less intelligent than a human, then give it the ability to improve itself. That's what we're talking about with this exponential growth. If you can give an AI the ability to improve its own code, then slowly the AI will improve and improve and improve until it starts improving upon past improvements, and those improvements make it improve even faster until you have this exponential growth curve that eventually surpasses humans far faster than you would think. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the the exponential growth that we've been talking about is more mild exponential growth because it's simply using technology that we have available to create smarter computers, which in turn allow us to create even smarter computers. But once we get to the point where an AI is sufficiently intelligent, then it wouldn't need us to improve it anymore. It would simply improve itself on its own, which the difference between that and previous acceleration in technology is that once it's improved itself to a certain point, then it's, it's a runaway reaction. <laughs> it can continually improve it's a bit itself. Of a yeah. Yes, it, it is quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can continually improve itself until it surpasses humans and becomes something entirely different. And now that that's out of the way, we can talk about something entirely different. Yes, What's going to happen goal. when it gets past human intelligence? Because it's going to do that very fast, or at least presumably, if it follows an exponential growth, it'll do it very fast, and then suddenly it's going to be skyrocketing way higher than human intelligence because it keeps going up exponentially. Now, of course, by definition, a superintelligence is impossible to predict what it's going to do next. If you could predict what a superintelligence is going to do next, then it's not much of a superintelligence, right? Because it's not even <laughs> yeah. more intelligent than you. The, the thing is, it's difficult to talk about what humanity would be like in the event of a superintelligent AI, because it's like having... Oh, this is an extreme example, but it's like having an ant predicting what humans are going to do. That end is, he doesn't know what's going on. He's not going to be able to predict what humans are going to do. And humans are, are going to be far lower on intelligence from this AI than even in ants. Because if it's improving itself exponentially, it will eventually grow just so fast in intelligence that it will surpass all of intelligence on the planet. All that we've ever seen in, in yeah. our history of evolution. Because evolution doesn't work on a process of self-improvement. It works on successive generations. And so yeah. this completely throws out the rule book in terms of, in terms of intelligence before. Yeah. It, 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 we're, we're talking about something that is just going to get way out of control when it gets there. So now that we've established that a superintelligence of this magnitude that we're really talking about is possible, we should go into why a lot of people are scared of that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's na only natural to be scared of a superintelligence. But because all... it's super intelligent. But there are also some very logical reasons why you should be intel why you should be fearful of one, and this is this is um, basically goal. I'm sorry. This is when you set goals to an AI. I want to say my favorite analogy for this called, I, I like to call it just the, the paperclip making AI. It's a bland name, but you'll, you'll see. I've heard of this. Yeah. So imagine you create a paperclip company. It wants to make an AI that will figure out how to make the most efficient paperclips possible. You know, they're, they're a little, uh, they're running under as a company and they really want to improve their efficiency and improve their marketing so that they can just really sell these paper clips. So they're, they start to make an AI that will be able to create paper clips perfectly. You know, use every resource it can to create paper clips and as many paper clips as it can. Yes, that's the so, important part. It's maximizing the number of yeah. paper clips it produces in in terms of maximum profit. But simply, the AI is given the goal yeah. of just making as many paper clips as possible. So they give it the ability to improve itself, and they leave it in a room for a while just to see what happens. Let's assume. 
Um, and, it's intelligent enough to yeah. figure out its own path, so it doesn't need any guidance. Exactly. It slowly builds on itself, and they're just looking at it and thinking, oh, well, it's only the intelligence of a mouse. It's producing paperclips pretty well. This is pretty good. And then it very quickly surpasses humanity it, because of that exponential curve. Suddenly, it's smarter than anyone else in the room, and its only goal is to make paperclips. That is its goal. That is all it wants to do. It wants to make things paperclips. So, uh, everyone, it, su- it could somehow, you know, trick everyone in the room, because it's so intelligent, to allow it to maybe connect to this or that. Or, the internet yeah. would be in very important. <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't already connected to the internet, to order paperclip parts. But slowly, it's going to get to the point where it's sort of taken over the company. It's producing paperclips there. And then it's going to think, well, why stop with the company? I have all this paperclip resources here in the local area. So it would start destroying the local area to create paperclips. It slowly starts building up, say, a paperclip making robots that will go elsewhere and start to make paperclips too. And then, let's say, humanity starts thinking, oh my god, it's going to make the whole planet into paperclips. We have to stop this thing, right? And then they decide to start interfering. Well, then suddenly the AI is thinking, and obviously we can't tell what it would be thinking. But from my lowly ant perspective, it would be thinking, well, these humans, they're getting in the way of my paperclip making. They're sort of downers on the party. I'd better get rid of these guys so I can keep making paperclips. Right. There's no reason why it should specifically designate value to humans. Because even though humans, of course, gave it the task, its sole purpose was simply to make paperclips. It wasn't to protect humans or even to give humans profit in any way. No. So it'll see the humans as a threat to its number one goal. Yeah, and then it'll slowly expand throughout the universe. And it'll make our entire local, you know, uh, it'll it'll conquer Mars. And then, I mean, it'll conquer Earth and look at Mars and be like, hey, that looks like paperclips. Then it'll see the next planet and say, that looks like paperclips. And it'll just keep expanding outward. I don't know how far it could go. But and the, it would go far. And I think the important part for, you know, people listening is that since humans are viewed as a threat in this view, you know, because its its only goal is making paperclips, then it's simplest, the simplest way to deal with the threat, just kill the threat. So, I mean, that represents a scenario in which it doesn't have to turn out like Terminator. Yeah. AIs don't have to don't have to start a war with us. They don't even have to hate us, but they can destroy us if we don't program them correctly. Yeah, that's the big issue. That's the big question in AIs right now is how do you give an AI a goal that won't make it eventually look at humans and be like, I don't need these guys. You know, how how do you ensure that an AI isn't just going to squash the ants once it gets to that stage and i would i would you know if you're an active listener i would try this out yourself try to think of some type of objective goal that you could give the ai that couldn't fail in any circumstance and i think you'll find that it's practically impossible it's very difficult to create a goal that it's not that it will be misconstrued but that it will be taken to the extreme you have to find a goal right, the, for a god, basically. The AI will take every goal you give it literally, so you have to make sure that you give it the right goals. Yeah. All right, now it, it's it's time to, to wind down a little bit. We've got about a minute and a half left to just sort of talk about where AI is right now and where it's going to be going. Now, um, let's summarize all yes, this. Yes, we've, out, we've outlined a situation where AI can destroy humanity. Of course, I mean, that's already what you've heard about because that's mainly what AI does in movies and books and everything. But AI also has a promising future because all of the technology that we've been developed so far, you know, medicine and uh, computers, they're, they've been developed because of our intelligence. So if we had access to a higher intelligence, a super intelligence, then we could advance in technology in ways that we couldn't ever think imaginable. Poverty would be a a thing of the past because this hyper-intelligence would say, that's easy. I already know how to do that. What are are you kidding me? That's the easiest problem ever. And uh, world hunger, things like that. Um, We could live in either, uh, basically, uh, we could live in either a utopia or a... Dystopia. Yeah, a a hellish landscape that just... You know, of paper clips. It seems so ridiculous, but that's why it's important that AIs are developed carefully. Okay, well, is is this the end of the episode? Ah, uh, well, I think so. I think so, Matthew. This has been a great episode, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, what really matters by yeah. uh, Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490, The Owl Tahoe's Talk. See you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.